So it's informal. It's the end of the day. Oh, I'm, <laughs> I'm Jeffy Kennedy. Uh, I write epic fantasy romance. I am the current president of the Science Fiction Fantasy Writers Association. I live up in Santa Fe. Uh, and I'm, oh, I'm just about done. I just was working on it. Almost done with my 64th Ooh, it's not done yet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jordan Jones, I live in Palace. I um, write paranormal mystery, uh, young adult, and straight mystery. All romance, all funny. Um, and I have uh, 28 and a quarter books. And then I think uh, well, I'm, I'm in the middle of this production line, apparently. <laughs> I've written 43 books over 43 years, basically, in this business. So, uh, and my attention span has been getting smaller and smaller and smaller <laughs> as the years go by. So, uh, you may have to remind me of your names in a few minutes. So. <laughs> All right, Reese. Uh, Reese. I've only written three. Well, that was four. I'm um, coming out with my fourth in July. So I kind of write um, kind of a variety of things, mostly kind of on the dark, uh, kind of maybe war side, kind of. Like my first one was historical fiction, my second was apocalyptic, my third evil punk, and my new one coming out in July is um, an AI sentence story. Oh, is that the one that I read? Uh, yes. Yeah, yes. Cool. <laughs> All right, no one likes a bagger. <laughs> Okay, that's the panel. Um, <laughs> comments or questions or thoughts? If there aren't questions, we can just go. Right, right. it's. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. We can do this at the bar. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, I, have, I actually do have a question about um, fantasy romance and sort of how um, just the hallmarks of that for you versus, you know, you're saying epic fantasy romance that versus epic fantasy and also um you know how explicit do you get in these fantasy romances can i ask that yes when she does her uh she has a podcast and she says that she writes uh fantasy romance and romantic fantasy yeah so there mm -hmm. is also yeah. a difference or as the kids are calling it these days romanticy, romanticy. yes, yes. <laughs> okay so i'd like to have so, okay, so here's the thing about genre, is it evolves over time. Um, genre is basically a way for readers to find the books that they want and for booksellers to put them on bookshelves or, you know, now we have like the online retailers with things that we shall not mention that code things by search terms, right? Mm -hmm. So when I first started writing fantasy romance, I did not know that was what I was writing. I was pitching it as paranormal romance or urban fantasy and was told in no uncertain terms that actually my work fell in the cracks between genres. She's a crack hoe. I was a crack hoe. <laughs> oh, my friends would call me a crack hoe consulting in the bar. There's a theme. Uh, so when I finally, finally got this first book that i would written published, um, they called it fantasy romance. And I was like, I've never even heard of fantasy romance. So this is, you know, like 12 years ago. Um, now it is a thing, and it's become such a thing that there are, and, and this is part of the evolution of genre, now everybody is identifying all of these niche sub-genres within it. So for a while there was kind of like the two, fantasy romance and romantic fantasy, which were sort of intended to differentiate between how much romance it was for each. Um, being that romantic fantasy was less uh, along the romantic strokes. And now there's all of these, you know, like people with Jennifer L. Armentrout, a lot of her fans started calling it romanticy. And, and, you know, now there's all these, you know, like, is it historical? Is it gas lamp? Is it all of these things? <laughs> so when I am trying to describe what I write, I started calling it epic fantasy romance because that seems to get closer to the fact that I'm writing these very long series with big political sweeps and a lot of fantasy world building, uh, but then still romance. And then as we don't transmit spice, but mine are very. 
five chili peppers is what I usually get. <laughs> Well, I, I I am not hip to the categories of romance or romantic fantasy, but I did find one the other day, uh, just browsing on Amazon, and it was, it was cowboy daddy hidden pregnancy romance. <laughs> this is a real thing. It's a real category. You can look it up. Browsing, you found that. But a cowboy. <laughs> 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 it was offered to me. It was within the articles. Yeah. But anyway, Cowboy Daddy is older guy, obviously, who happens to be a cowboy, and younger girl, and she gets pregnant, and he, she has to conceal it from him for some reason. That's, that's the trope. And those yeah. are, yeah, all these tropes that people search specifically for, mm -hmm. especially romance. And, it's, yeah. I, I, and I don't know, you know, it's missing aliens, it's missing dinosaurs, I don't see the I, I mean, this could be that. your opportunity. <laughs> it's, I mean, this, this could be yeah. what you do. It could be huge. <laughs> Daddy dinosaur. Because <laughs> 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 we all know that dinosaur erotic is a real thing, right? Yeah. 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 Our other Talish Riders group has discussed not this. Not us. Someone's in the group. Yes, it, it's discussed that in detail. <laughs> <That's good. laughs> it needs to be discussed. All right, these are supposed to be rapid fire questions. Rapid fire before questions. Us. Okay. Anything you want to know? What about science fiction, erotic or science fiction fantasy? Does that exist as a genre? Yes. Mm -hmm. no. See Samuel R. Delaney. Mm. <laughs> I'll use incognito. <laughs> <laughs> Has anyone besides Fritz Leibler done robot sexual um, ma sexual masochistic uh, erotic? Oh God, yes, a little. <laughs> <laughs> okay, full disclosure. I used to be one of the people who ran the what was called a. Uh, uh, Turkey readout after dark at a convention in Colorado, which is finding the weirdest erotica you can probably find, <laughs> reading it out loud for an audience, and it was laughing hysterically. <laughs> so the answer is, if, yeah, if you can think of it, somebody's writing it and some it under, you know, a suit on Amazon. Well, yeah. just, just remember Rule 34, if you if think of something, somebody's written erotica about it. <laughs> and it went much further than Chris Lieber. <laughs> 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 I mean, we could talk about like one of the biggest categories of fantasy romance right now is the monster romance, mm -hmm. um, you know, and that is some pretty very spicy stuff. Uh -huh. and <laughs> it's just like going past me. <laughs> <and laughs> like shake out of water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Water. pregnancy by the green slime. <laughs> Morning Glory Milking Farm by Sam Mistoski. Morning Glory Milking Farm. Right. And it is not actual milking, but I'm really, I'm really disturbed that 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 just popped right out of you. It's a good book and a sweet. And the 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 creature being the old is a Minotaur. So it's a it's a thing. You watch Dave. I just was trying to understand some of the terminology you were using, and they also used it in that show, and I was using it as the same thing, but I don't want to get into it. So. Right, I mean, yeah, because this is not the erotic panel. Mm -hmm. Some people may be unwillingly. <laughs> <laughs> So did you purchase the cowboy? <laughs> no, I did not. <laughs> Is there? Another? Although I did click on the author's name to see what else there. <laughs> and it was all Daddy yeah. Cowboy. Next year we'll all, talk to the Daddy Cowboy all the way down. No, but I was on one at WorldCon in Chicago. You know what you're doing? Yeah. Yeah, last last September. I was like the most mild manner. <laughs> so, Reese, you're like a bunch of different kind of genres? I sort of, yeah. Does that affect your cells? Because your readers don't, they're like, no, 
worry about. <laughs> <laughs> I have I have like a fan base that likes whatever I write, so you know, I, I I just I I have to like you know I have to be interested in what I write. Uh -huh. So if I I'm, I'm gonna get bored if I do the same thing. People have come to trust me. <laughs> yeah, you know, I have also written in quite a large number of subject lines. Well, there is a small group of devoted fans, I have to say, that probably hasn't been mature. Mm -hmm. But most people want the same thing over and over again, only different. And uh, yeah. I did, I, I was, is it really like that dance often? I don't remember. But I, I watched a uh, workshop recently, and she's an indie author, and she was doing different genres, you know, and she couldn't really get anywhere. And so she was talking to a friend of hers, and her friend basically told her to stay in your own life. She said, pick a lane and stay in it. And it, it worked for her. It's not for everybody. I'm not oh, saying it's yeah. for everybody. But it worked for her. She decided, okay, I'm going to stick with romantic suspense. And um, I think she actually, maybe domestic thrillers, I could be wrong. Um, and she picked, she branded her covers to where they're different but the same. There's clearly a brand. And her career just took off. And she's going like crazy. So, yeah, I mean, there is something to be said for that. It, but then, does she regret not writing any of these other genres that she loves? I mean, she didn't say. The phrase domestic thriller caught my ear. And speaking of someone who spent the pandemic loading the dishwasher, and loading the dishwasher, loading the dishwasher. But your husband is still alive. Your husband's still alive. <laughs> he cooks really well. So I try to be grateful for that. Don't. You know, make him love the dishwasher. So I want to know what these domestic thrillers are that could, could uh, thrill up my my domestic life. It's usually uh, a, a, a lot of them are about not all of them, but a lot of them are about like the husband dies, and the wife who thinks she knew her husband inside and out finds all these things out about him after he dies. Uh -oh. That's one of the kind of lanes in that. Uh -huh. um, Victoria else? Helen Stone writes really good ones. Um, yeah, so it's like, yeah, finding out that your husband's actually trying to kill you, or, um, you know, Double Jeopardy with yeah. Ashley Judd, it was like from a John Grisham novel, it's kind of that sort of thing. Uh, a lot of times there's like some kind of abuse in the household, or, yeah, so there's... It's it's usually strong... Right, right. Yeah, I am. Um... I had a student who was a very successful Kindle Unlimited writer, mm -hmm. and he, he wrote, uh, I don't even remember what they were at this point, uh, they were thrillers, mm -hmm. and, but he was doing 14 a year, mm -hmm. and he got- Which is the key to- Yeah, to being <laughs> successful Kindle Unlimited In writer. Kind of, yeah. yeah. Uh, and he was getting really bored with it, because he was just writing the same book over and over and over again. Yeah, he's so writing that fast. He wanted to sell an epic fantasy series, preferably to a- uh, you know, publisher, and uh, so that's why he was in my class anyway. Um, you know, and he he really worked out this fantasy world. He obviously cared about it a good deal, uh, but you know, had never written a fantasy before. So there were there were a few rough spots, but now I see that it is for sale on Kindle Unlimited. We just got a new name and a new genre. Okay, okay, but do I, not sell it to a New York publisher. Well, that takes too long. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I was cleaning house once, and I found a little. ID card case that was read and said in Cyrillic letters, KGB. <laughs> so I turned to Walter and I said, you never told me you were an opportunist. <laughs> but but now I must kill you. <laughs> <laughs> but it didn't have the ID card in it. He was waiting to find a typewriter that did Cyrillic letters. This was yeah. back in yeah. the, the pre-computer days and, mm -hmm. and never never turned it into a... It was a genuine card. KGB ID card. That was ID folder. I bought it from some Russian people who I don't know what their connections were. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Thanks. 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 We could talk. Find out stuff you don't want to hear about. What are like the pros and cons of writing like a very targeted genre? Is that not a short question? Sorry. <laughs> it's, it's not a short question because I think first I'm going to have to question your purpose. Yeah. Is do do we really write to a very targeted genre? Um, 
There are certainly people who do that, like Walter's talking about this. Yeah. I'm not sure anyone here does that. Um, and we talked about this some on the world building panel too, that very few writers actually know what genre they're writing when they're writing the story, uh, especially when you're starting out. You usually end up being told later what it is you're writing. Like I didn't know what I was writing was fantasy romance. Um, when I am writing now, I don't worry that much about, like, is this more fantasy or, or is this more romance or am I, you know, going for a particular genre um, or subgenre? There are certainly people who do it, you know, like the monster romance uh, stuff. People are going for very, very particular tropes. The, the cowboy daddy secret baby. <laughs> they were going for very, very particular tropes, very particular audience. And it's one way of writing the prose being that you know who your audience is. And if you're good at rapid release, particularly self-publishing, Kindle Unlimited, you can have a nice career that way. Um, cons, uh, I think you have to have a very particular kind of writer brain to be able to do that. And I don't think anyone here thinks yeah. that way of their stories. Like your students yeah. you know, yeah. writing the same thing over there. Yeah. 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 For me, the one thing that has to remain notice with my readers is the, the romance and the comedy. Yeah. They really expect that from me. And if I don't have the comedy, they're kind of thrown off. Um, and so I have to be very... Yeah, because you've had a couple of stories where people are like, well, that wasn't funny. Right, right. And like, oh, dear. It's a good story, but what happened? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, what, what do you do if you can think of if you come up with a really, really good idea? Mm -hmm. That is not neither funny right, nor romantic. Right. You know, it, Which I've done. It was a pseudonym. Uh, you could, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. But then you have to like build up your audience for the day. Mm -hmm. you know, and that's how you find a way to put comedy and romance into the writing. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's yeah. what you end up doing, right? And that's that. actually, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I was telling you, Jeffy, earlier that <laughs> yeah, the, I had this uh, female in the Victorian area, she's a female serial killer. And my editor was just in love with this idea. She loved it, so I pitched it to her, and then I sent her the epilogue, but it was not funny, it was very dark. And she's like, oh no, no, she rejected it. Um, and I was like, okay, now I know. So, and people were like, well, why don't you just make it funny? Uh, like, hilarious, Victoria. <laughs> <laughs> but if you think about um, Killing Eve, that's the one that I, oh, yeah. one of those that I wish I had thought of. It's hilarious, and mm -hmm. she's a female. Well, she's an assassin, but she's pretty much along the lines yeah, of a serial killer. Right, exactly. Yeah. But she's hilarious. It's the funniest thing ever. And I'm like, I could do this. It could be like a very dark humor, but still, mm -hmm. do it. Mm -hmm. I have the voice of a historical writer. Which you're told you do not. I'm told I do not. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe someday. I'll work. I think that's something about it. It's like your voice, what genres or genre or genres you end up writing in is an offshoot of your voice. Mm -hmm. It's because you you start telling the story in the way that you want to tell it, and that is just over time it refines. Mm -hmm. uh, the more that you write, the more you distill down to what your voice is, and genre kind of comes out of that. I mean, sometimes there's variations. You know, it's like, oh, this time I'm going to do a space opera instead of an epic fantasy. But it's pretty rare for somebody to go to something completely different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I generally allow the story to dictate the voice, but yeah. I have a very flexible voice. So for the Quillifer books, which are set in a, a kind of uh, quasi Renaissance fantasy world, um, it's a Tudor voice. And I'm having great fun with 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 the uh, with that dialect and the vocabulary. Mm -hmm. Particularly for abuse, you can really <laughs> you sir are a fustilarian belly god. <laughs> and, and at the same time, I'm writing at the, the space opera, which has you know a very modern, fluid, high high science fiction book. Do you ever get messed stuff going no. back and forth? <laughs> no, they're they're too different. Some of the others are. Yeah. yeah. That kind of hits on why, like, to address your question, why, you know, the, the fan base that follows, I think it's because they feel like my voice mm -hmm. and they, they, they like my themes. Mm -hmm. And so I think when you start looking at that, that can become more important in the genre because 
You, and you, I'm sure everyone's had the experience of picking up a book with a great premise but not connecting with the voice. I mean, that mm -hmm. you have to love a voice. Yeah. And readers will generally follow an author's voice. I mean, there's right. a, a long history in publishing of the publishers attempting to be the brand that mm -hmm. readers follow. The publishers really, really want that. They want you to like go pick up a McMillan book or go pick up a, a tour book. You know, and so maybe you know you'll be like, oh, it's tour. Okay, cool. But what when as readers you all know that what you follow are the authors. You find an author you like, and then I think we've all had that experience where then you go and then devour their entire mm -hmm. backlist, right? You don't care about those you and you know whether you can trust them to like wrap up the story in a satisfactory way. Mm -hmm. And you can't always trust new authors, but once you trust somebody, you're like, okay, even if this is going weirdly, I, I'm gonna trust it. Something you know left over time. Yeah. And you know they won't kill the dog. Yes. Yeah, that's <laughs> you know, you don't tell the children. That's my thing, like you'll <laughs> uh, I have I have the entire plot of one of my books revolved around a actress kicking a dog. <laughs> And it was caught on video, and her career was destroyed. Wow. And so she went looking for the guy who took the video. <laughs> Ooh, and then she kill him? <laughs> well, I, I don't want to give away the story. <laughs> <laughs> what was the title? Uh, hmm? It's called The Fourth Wall. Mm -hmm. it's quickly yeah. It yeah. And uh, it, was, it was actually a much more complex story than that. But that was just one of the elements where she said, uh, you know, she, because the guy who took the photo thought, he was showing that she was in obvious pain because she'd been going through some horrible life changes, mm -hmm. right? And was out of her mind on drugs, and the dog was annoying her, and she kicked it away, and then that's all anyone saw. Right? Um, so, uh, you know, he didn't he didn't mean to victimize her. He just meant to, you know, sell a nice video to the tablet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have y'all ever collaborated with someone? And if so, what kind of formula do you use to share? Was that to, to all of us? To yeah. Okay. You have a friend trying have, to well, collaborate, and I so have, I'm, it's I'm a member fun. of the world's largest, most complex, and most detailed collaboration uh, corporation in the world, and it's called Wild Cards. Wow. Uh, Is it really the largest? I've run. Tr I've lost track of how many writers are in. Mm. They're well over thirty, you know, and, and uh, there are over thirty books. And there, there's just a whole pipeline full of these books that people can't seem to get out fast enough. And uh, it's and it's changed over the years because at the beginning it was a bunch of young, uh, ambitious writers who were collaborating, and we were very. Um, uh, we were very cooperative with each other. So, and in what we were, way do y'all collaborate? Okay, well, it's it's shared <coughs> work, so we each have our own characters. Mm -hmm. Other people can write using our characters with our permission, uh, and there's an inducement for it because if some other writer uses our character, we get paid. And one thing yes. I like about this, because I've heard Melinda talk uh -huh. about it, is that with permission, but also they have to tell you like what they're gonna like. They can't kill your character or well, do not something. without your permission. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Or, or so there are there are a whole class of, 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 of redshirt characters who have created that. Yeah, anyone can kill them. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but some of them we have plans for. But you know, a lot it allowed us to develop these characters with really long arcs, and that was kind of interesting. It was, and we'd say, okay, well, John John's character needs to be in the next book because his arc is going to take. Yeah, and and as it got bigger and as it got more complex, George began to uh, become a lot more uh, authoritarian <laughs> about this stuff, and so and and it and he has to, he has to be. There are just too many people involved. So this whole kind of we used to be able to all at Worldcon get together for dinner and talk about what was going to happen in the next few books, right? And, and, uh, and that can't happen anymore because we can't all fit in the same room anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so I tried to do a collaboration with a friend of mine who is also a writer, and he and I put together this whole proposal. We had this idea that we were going to try to write, it was a science fiction story, um, kind of a, a Star Trek-ish type story, and we were set it up so that we would do alternating chapters and I would write the heroine's POV and he would write the hero's POV. 
And my agent liked it so much that she ended up signing him. And we worked on this for a while. Um, we would pass it back and forth and we would revise each other's chapters. And ultimately we decided, um, we were both working on other things. My agent thought, eh, she said, it's just not gelling. Uh, we never got to the point where we could smooth the voices so that it sounded enough like, so it was cohesive. Mm -hmm. um, we still talk about going back to it, but I think it would, it would just take a fair amount of work for us to do it. Yeah. Um, now, I interviewed a lot of writing teams at the time to see how they would do it. Uh, and like I know of one, uh, Christina Lauren, who has two gals, and they live in different places, but they work in a Google Doc, and they're online at the same time, and they can actually watch each other typing, uh, which kind of gives me hives. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't want anybody, even a collaborator, seeing my first drafts. No. I, yeah. Because well, if I look at my first drafts, I fall into despair. You know? <laughs> God, and, and that's kind of what Jim and I ran into because, um, you know, like I would write my chapters in my very Gardner, write for Discovery, pants away, right. and he would say, well, I can see that you're setting this up about her background. Where, what, what actually happened there? I'm like, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't figured that out yet. So, One of the best yeah. stories of, of that sort of collaboration between Harlan Ellison and um, Theodore Sturgeon. And, and Sturgeon had a big problem with writer's block, and Harlan was trying to get him out of it. So let's, let's do a collaboration. They were alternating chapters. But they started having too much fun with it. And so each chapter ended on a cliffhanger. And then the other mm -hmm. author would have to figure out a way for the hero to <laughs> escape them. this area. And then, and then there would be a cliffhanger at the end of the next chapter that the other one. And finally, Harlan wrote one where the it was a literal cliffhanger the guy was hanging on off the edge of the cliff with a hundred foot drop into a pit full of snakes and alligators and spikes right and <laughs> and and his and his fingernails were going one by one right and and, it, and at the very last the last fingernail gave way and he plummeted into the abyss and then he sent it to Sturgeon they were living in different towns mm -hmm. and the next chapter came back with the first sentence, after he had cleverly escaped. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've been asked to collaborate with you, Chunks, and I, I just, you know, I don't know how to do it. I understand it, and I've talked to people who collaborate, and, you know, uh, two friends of mine that wrote a couple books where it was one of those, they were reading a journal, so it would go back in time. Mm -hmm. And so the, the contemporary writer would write the contemporary parts, and the historical writer would write the historical parts, and they would go with each chapter. Mm -hmm. And um, they're no longer friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like so, I'm like, and they were like best friends. So I'm like, I don't know that I want it. Oh, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. I was a there was a, a epic fantasy that I started writing when I was like 14. Okay. And and I, I went back and looked at it at some point. This is kind of promising. It's actually a good idea, but I don't want to write it all by myself. So I thought I'll franchise it. Yeah. So I got four other collaborators, and we were splitting up the story, and it it just ran out of momentum. Right. It was a problem. It was it just got too complex. Um, yeah, and there are a few other people that we've agreed to collaborate on stuff. It didn't work out. Uh, well, we just haven't started yet. Yeah. And then I, I was in the middle of a collaboration with Rogers Elastin when he passed. So. That was an excuse. We had, <laughs> yeah, we, we were at a convention in New York, and we worked at, we were sitting across the aisle from each other on the plane home, and we worked out the whole plot. Well, and it was going to be an epistolary novel set in the 18th century. Oh, so that neither of us would you know, be out of our comfort zone, mm -hmm. both of us. So we, yeah. Yeah. I've done the sort of shared world thing that. Um, that Walter has. I, I, my second novel, Holding the Ashes, was a uh, the post apocalyptic one, was in a shared world. So we came up, somebody else created the world, and we each got to choose a different part of the world to have our story take place in. We got to come up with our own characters. And that was kind of cool because we could pass along ideas like, like I came up with the idea, it was, it was had death gods in it. I came up with the idea that Trinity from the um, nuclear explosions could kill the death gods. So everybody used that in their books. So that was kind of cool. And that was, that was a successful collaboration that I had a lot of fun with. 
And the novels are like standalone novels, so I can just sell it as its own novel, and it, nobody has to read the others. I have had friends who've done that, or the alternating chapter thing. Um, my friends, Wendy and Alicia Zaloga wrote, I can't remember their last names, um, but they wrote one called The Resurrectionist of Caligula that came out from Angry Robot, and that was successful. The problem they ran into was that they um, had trouble doing another one together and both kind of struggled to write on their own afterwards, mm -hmm. after that experience. Oh. <coughs> you know, a friend of mine has, uh, I don't know that Amazon, I think Amazon could do this, but you are. She, there's a, for a while there's a thing where you can have a world that you can have other writers write in the world. You know, Kindle world, Kindle world, yeah. and she asked me to do it, and she said that you need to know that Amazon will own this story forever. Mm -hmm. It will never be your story, and I had to. She's one of my best friends. I'm like, no, no, <laughs> no it's not terrible. <laughs> and no, it's not okay. So, and she's like, no, I understand because she still has. Every time they do it, there's like 25 books come out in her world, and this is like every six months. I'm like, oh my gosh. So, any other questions out there? Um, have y'all ever thought about turning any of your uh, books into films? Well, it's not us who can turn them in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> unless, unless we have, you know, $50 million in the bank and are willing to risk True. all of it. So, yeah, I have a Hollywood agent. He's occasionally made a sale for me, but nothing ever came. I, I wrote one episode of Andromeda that actually got filmed, and I regret it. <laughs> it, was, it was a. It wasn't. It wasn't. I, I, you know, I, I'm not saying that my script was the most brilliant thing in the world, but um, mine. It was. <laughs> the, the problem was their guest star um, was not. I guess a fairly new actress, and she froze every time they pointed the camera at her. Oh, she couldn't remember her lines, she couldn't remember how to act. They finally told her just to move her lips, and someone else would dub in the dialogue. And she was supposed to be in the romance with the captain. And so they, they canceled that because it was too late. It had already been precast once. She was the last one to play. And, uh, and it was a 10 day shooting schedule, and it went through 28 scripts during the course of the time. Oh my God. <laughs> Yeah, and so, I think my five best lines actually survived, but that was it. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. You know, like, <laughs> so mine, um, I've sold a few times. I've been stuff has been auctioned a few times. Mm -hmm. um, the one that I really thought was going to get made, uh, That Day for Sunshine, uh, was auctioned by Paramount. Um, they wrote the pilot. They had producer, director attached. They started casting. I thought, this is really going to happen, you know? It gets to the last stage and they kill it. So yeah. you never know. Mm -hmm. So Charlie just my Charlie Gason series just sold again. It was just option for the third time. So fingers crossed something happens this time. So okay. <laughs> we'll see. Um, George R. R. Martin used to say that there is somebody at every uh, TV network with a title of the vice president in charge of saying no. <laughs> and, uh, whenever it comes up to that vice president, yes. the, the whole they idea. just yeah, they have one job. Yeah. 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 No, I always feel like that. I, I, you know, I was sitting earlier with Dorinda and Rebecca Roanhorse, and they were both going back and forth talking about, oh yeah, when this book is option, when this book is option, and all this, and I'm like. <laughs> so you know, it's um, yeah. It would be great. Yes, yeah. I think we all we all fantasize yeah, about it, it. And, and it's I mean it's amazing money. I mean like for for George that like was the the catapult to mm -hmm. the next level. HBO did great Game of Thrones, and you know there well, are well, certainly I've, a, yeah. I've known George for a long time. Game of Thrones is his fourth career. Right. Uh, right. I mean, you know, he yeah. started out as an analog writer, right in the early seventies, late sixties, maybe. Yeah. I, I use him often as an example of the overnight success yeah, yeah. <laughs> for like 40 years. Mm -hmm, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, it, as far as like name recognizability and all of that kind of thing, mm -hmm. you know, there are so many more people who watch right. TV and film than read, than yeah. read that, you know, it's like, yeah, oh, great. I kind of wanted to read too. 
<laughs> yes, but well, what you hope is that then they'll go read yeah, the books, right? right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or you know, like right before the show comes or just out. Just give like, me enough money so that I don't care if they don't read it. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. You don't have to read it, you just have to buy it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you're a publishing indie, how do you approach um, international markets or do you? Do you approach international markets? Yeah, and sometimes they approach us. I mean, I, I do have that. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but yeah, uh, they will, publishers from other countries will contact me and ask about some of my UV series. Mm -hmm. And then I just, I do have an agent, so I just send them to her and she negotiates the deal. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you can also pay to have your own stuff translated, but. It's really nice if the foreign publishers pick up your books. And it's weird because paying yourself to get such translated, there's so many laws. And so I have this, a friend of mine is a German translator. Is it German? No, French. I'm sorry, it's French. Um, and but she's not actually French, but she's amazing as well. Anyway. <clears throat> so I contacted her, I was like, for my indie series, I was like, you know, would you think about doing this? Well, then I started looking at the laws, and for her to translate it, she owns that copyright in France. I don't own it. She owns it. It's her book. You know? And I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know how that works, because I mean, I'm not in France. Um, yeah, they don't have a... Uh... Work made for hire in Europe. Right. So you can't just hire a translator on your own. Right. right. Even the translator has intellectual property rights. Right, right. Yeah. 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 And, so, and right. speaking of my official capacity, we said, well, we just passed a referendum on that where we are considering translators as that they can qualify for CIPLA membership as a translator mm -hmm. because translation is considered to be a mm -hmm. creative process mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you, know, yeah. you transform the work. Yeah. But I, we had, Quite a lot of debate about it. I sold a bunch of uh, books to Russia in the 90s after the wall fell. And um, some of them ended up on the translator's website after they fell out of print. Oh. And his thing was, no, I own it. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 So if you. Just like a case of being Now let's say we're connecting. That's true. I mean, yeah. yeah. That's right. So, so essentially, that's all right. When you. Like if I sell rights to a foreign press, then that's exactly what I'm doing. Is I'm selling the rights to them, just as like if I sold to Tor or something like that, um, that they do have that copyright and they have rights to certain. I mean, we won't go too far into it, but you know, like the first publication rights, and then you have rules where it can revert to or not. Um, yeah, generally European contracts are different because there's a term limit. Yes. You know, they are they are allowed to publish for five years and then you either renew the contract or not. Mm -hmm. And so um, and generally they'll make their money back in five years, and if they're making a lot of money, they'll want to continue to renew it. So um, but yeah, that, that that is in part to deal with with their situation. You know. um, so far as I know, no translator has actually sold any of my work without my permission. So. I have a friend of mine who um, got around the laws and she found a German translator here in America. And so I, she translates all of her stuff into German and into German and then uh, she just puts it on Amazon, the German Amazon site, and sells it that way. But the translator doesn't have rights to her to any copy. It's mm -hmm. international. And I do know a couple of indie authors who have been doing the uh, using Google Translate oh, no. No, to translate no, no, their no, books no, no, and no. then get, getting somebody who knows the language to like go through and read and oh, edit. Yeah. Uh, but even so, I yeah. think that that's uh, that's yeah, how they're trying to get around it. And I just I mean, don't feel like that's like getting ChatGPT to write your book. Yeah. Okay. So is that cheating? Is it cheating? Is that cheating? <laughs> I mean, like ChatGPT to like plot for you. Well, since nobody's grading you, then there is no cheating. But um, remember that it basically it gives you something that looks like the answer that you want. Mm -hmm. That's entirely how ChatGPT is. So it's like up. a psych. So it'll create a <laughs> facsimile of 
what it thinks you want, mm -hmm. which is probably not how you want to write your books. I mean, if you're only in it for the money, for, even for your plots. If the, so I'm, I say this over and over again, and everyone's probably tired of hearing me say it, but if you are wanting to be a writer just so just for the money, yes. there are easier <laughs> ways to make a living. Go make a living doing something else. You should only be a writer if you are burning to write your own stories. Mm -hmm. You should only be a writer if you can't help yourself. <laughs> yeah, my husband actually asked me that a couple days ago. He said, there's this new program now. Oh, no, so it's like AI. AI. Yeah. You know, He's like, why don't you just put your stuff in here and he'll write it for you. <laughs> oh, tell, tell him you can write his songs. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's what they did. He said that they put it in a song lyric, because my husband's a musician, and they put in a song lyric, she's like, came up with this and they weren't bad. I'm like, damn, <laughs> No, no AI can write in my voice. It just, I'm sorry. And it supposedly can study your voice and learn it. Like, no, no. What is the point of that? Though? Right, what's the point? What's the point? Right. Yeah, there's easier ways to make a little advice. You know, go do something else. I was half kidding. <laughs> but, well, but that's it's, like it's, the serious answer to the half kidding. Yeah. yeah. Sure, Charlie's Ross had an interesting thing about Chat GPT. All the buzz on Chat GPT came exactly six months uh, after cryptocurrency collapsed. Yeah. Which means all the same scam artists that were trying to sell you mm -hmm. cryptocurrency are now trying to sell you Chat GPT and instruct, you know. For five hundred dollars, we just send you this instructional video on how to use Chat GPT to write best-selling novels and make millions of dollars. Right? Is that like on a website? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you can Google and find it. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and, so, and and because there are there are few, scams that like they're that very yeah. Chat GPT and started asking for all my information. Uh, oh. Yeah, like, oh, there there are very right. few uh, uh, magazines. Uh, magazines that's, that actually pay an author, which is why science fiction magazines got inundated with thousands of these bad science fiction stories, uh, because they thought they could make a stunning amount of money at, you know, five cents a word or whatever they're all paying. Eight, eight yeah. is the professional minimum pro rate. Yeah, right. right. And because somebody told them to do that, right, that you, you will have it immensely. And, and then, you know, they said, well, they write back and say, well, you, you know, everything that this thing wrote kind of got rejected and said, that's because you haven't learned how to use it yet. And for here, five hundred dollars. <laughs> we will have we will we will send you our instructional video as to all of the finer details of writing fiction with chat GPT. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what are the, the joy is in the journey and her right. so joy so much joy for lost. so long. <laughs> <laughs> So have any of you collaborated? I'm just going to ask you this question. Have any of you collaborated with ChatGPT? Yeah. <laughs> I decided. <laughs> I decided. I'm doing it. Yeah, I, you know, ChatGPT went bad really fast. Because I know one writer in, in Duluth, of all places, who said, well, he asked it, okay, um, I'd like to rob a bank in Duluth. What is the best way to do it? And it said, no, I cannot advise you on how to commit a crime. Oh. So, and then he said, I am uh, I am writing a crime novel about robbing a bank in Duluth. <laughs> <laughs> and how should I uh, how should I tell my fictional characters to rob this bank? And he came up with an incredibly detailed plan. I don't know where it would work. Well, I know that uh, David Sweetman was saying that um, he can now tell you what when his students' papers are written, they oh yeah, uh, sure. he, it's, you can tell. It's, <laughs> it's a very, very short learning curve. Yeah. Right. Um, right. But the, the thing is that this, this, this bank robbery, the, the AI actually knew that Duluth is built on a hill, so that like the front entrance to this building, they have one street, and the back entrance will be one floor lower on another street because of the change. Of, and it, and this was a vital part of the plan. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, you're young. I know that you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little old for prison. <laughs> well, I have a writer friend who was trying to figure out what to name, like a a floating battle station kind of thing. He was trying to come up with something better than 
battle station and he wanted to convey that like people lived down there too and he'd ask me about it and I'd come up with some ideas and then he tried putting it through chat GPT and came up with two lists of 10 names and I mean some of them were kind of interesting but then others were completely absurd uh -huh. and, and he ended up like going back to I actually came up with just calling it by the name of the ship yeah which was the it's like oh you don't actually have to use the descriptor just name it you know, like the high period. Okay, guys, you're, you're flagging on this whole question. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, we got one from the moderator. Okay. What are y'all watching these days? Oh. Oh, oh no. <laughs> um, I'm watching The Night Agent. Um, oh, that was I'm good. Oh, that is that, that is a really good thrill, at least so far. I've only got three episodes. It's got some nice twists. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't watch a ton of stuff. I read a lot. Um, but I watched Sandman. I really enjoyed watching season one of Sandman. Um, I'm watching Ted Lasso season three. <clears throat> uh, watched a really interesting movie the other night. I nearly brought it up during our. Uh, when we were talking to the screenwriting students, but it's called, it's worth watching. It's a 1971 movie called Carnal Knowledge. Oh, yeah. But, yeah, I had never seen it with this very, very young Jack Nicholson. Carol Kane is, is in it. She's 19. Uh, Art Garfunkel is in it. Uh, and Margaret, Candace Bergen. But there, it is, it's not an uplifting movie, but it is fascinating. And what was really interesting about screenwriting-wise is that there is this scene that is apparently a very famous scene where Jack Nicholson and Anne Margaret have this enormous fight. Do you remember this scene, Walter? Mm -hmm. uh, where she like then you know tries to kill herself at the end. Uh -huh. But it's um sorry, spoiler. But <laughs> it's um it's just this really intense emotional fight. Yeah. And the screenwriter was really worried that Jack Nicholson was not going to get all the subtlety. We were talking about this with screenwriting, that you can't write into your screenplay how the character is feeling and thinking, mm -hmm. that you just have to put the words in. So the screenwriter was really worried that Jack Nicholson was not going to get this whole arc of varying emotions throughout this fight. And they filmed it, and they did it in one take, and Jack Nicholson like got it perfect. And the screenwriter went to the director and said, what did you tell him? How did you tell him to do all of that? And the director said, I didn't. He just got it mm -hmm. from the script. Yeah. That, that's just, he plays a character who might as well be known as Mr. Toxic Masculinity. Yes. <laughs> uh, and, yeah. And that's, that's what it, and it said in the 50s. When you could do that. When you could do that. <laughs> Out loud and in public for as long as you wanted. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, um, and it, it's an interesting thing, you know, like when we talk about stories and we were talking in the world building panel, panel about figuring out what your story is about, uh, watching movies like that can help you figure out how to distill down the story to what it's about. Um, one thing that I like to do, I'm sorry if I'm like going on, no, on a tangent here. here. Um, so Pride and Prejudice, a lot of us have read it. I love to watch the shorter movie with Karen Knightley and Matthew McFadden. I've done this several times now, actually, and watched it in tandem with the BBC, Jennifer Ailey, Colin Firth version. Because what they've done in the shorter version, both are very good. I prefer the Karen Knightley, Matthew McFadden, just because the movie is so brilliant at distilling the elements of the story. And people will say, oh, well, but the BBC version has all of the subplots and all of the characters and it does a better job of telling, of replicating the book. But when you watch the shorter version and you can watch them side by side and go beat by beat and see what did they cut out? What parts of the story were not absolutely necessary to telling the core story? And that doesn't mean that you have to do that with your novel. You don't have to leave all that stuff out, but it helps you to know which things in there have to be there for you to tell the story 
and which things are just adding other kinds of layers and elements. That was kind of a long story. <laughs> no. <laughs> so you know me. So I did watch the Night Nation. That was great. Um, but uh, so I just watched this, a K drama. <laughs> it is called, they had the weirdest name, so just know that going into this. It was called What's Wrong with Sec Secretary Kim? And I kept hearing about it. I was like, that's such a weird title. I can't even watch it. Oh my God, it's so good. From like five minutes in, I was so good. It was so good. So here's the thing about Asian film. Korea knows how to be romance. America, yeah, we like um, the little romance a, a lot of the times. And so even, even in romantic comedies, we do yeah. a little romance. Whereas Korea does not. If, if the focus is romance, it's romance. And it's almost like old school romance, like just sweet, sweet romance. Um, Japan does horror, like nobody's business. Like their mm -hmm. horror is incredible. It just, it's so much scarier than that. Um, but anyway, yes, yeah, so I watch a lot of films. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of Korean films. Uh, speaking of Korean uh, extraordinary attorney Wu. Oh my god, yeah. so good. That is so charming. I, it's, I, I, it's so good. Yeah. It's, I've seen the it whole thing. It is so yeah. charming. Fresh landing is into you. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, yes. Vincenzo, yeah. so Vincenzo is one of my top ones, and it's on Netflix. Extraordinary Wu, attorney mm -hmm. Wu is on Netflix as well. Mm -hmm. Their, their, their plots are so much more complex than we, like, they're so clever how they have the solution. Reborn Rich is another one. They're just so clever, and, and every episode comes to a conclusion for that story itself. And, but then there's always this overarching thing. So if you want to write series, I highly recommend these, because this comes to a conclusion, but you still have your own overarching which all series do that, I'm sure. But they're just so clever. The, 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 the writing is so good. Is it Money Heist? Oh, yes. Yeah. The House on Netflix, it's a Spanish series. The first two seasons are wonderful. The last three seasons are not as wonderful. Have you seen the Korean one? I haven't seen it yet. I started watching it. It was just so close to the Spanish version. Oh, really? Ever, okay. Yeah, I, I just gave up on it. Uh, except that the, the guy who played, oh, what was his name? Uh, he was sort of the, the, the guy who was running the heist from inside the bank, the really creepy guy. They found a Korean actor who looked just like him and acted just like him. And it was, it, it, I don't think that was necessarily a good thing, but it was really a um, lot. And uh, apropos Spanish TV. Um, Paradise. Paradise, right. It's a, it's a uh, mystery thriller uh, with a older woman Finnish detective who was sent? Who was sent to Spain on the coast of Del Sol to uh, deal with some Finnish people who have got murdered down there? And she teams up with this uh, hot young Spanish man detective, and romance ensues. Very unlike she's she's like close to retirement age, and he's young and good looking. And it's a it's, I don't think I've seen that before. But I was thinking um, Ministerio del Tiempo. Oh yeah, the Ministry of Time. And the the story behind this is that time travel exists and the Spanish government has it. Hmm. And no one else does. Yeah, and it's it's got a it's just got great stuff in it because all of their agents come from the past. And uh, so they got, they got one guy who's a soldier. Well that yeah, that comes <laughs> up, oddly enough. Uh, <laughs> but they they have one one guy who's a soldier from the sixteenth century. Um, and everyone else in the department keeps calling him Capitan Ali Triste, and he can't figure it out. Why are they calling me this? And then he, he he's in a bookstore for some reason, and he sees Capitan Ali Triste on the shelf, and he steals it so that he could read it and find out why people are calling him after this character. Yeah. Did y'all watch Severance? Yes. And then actually, there is a Capitan Ali Triste Spanish series too, starring many of the same people. Severance was awesome. They nailed that final episode. I thought that they were, I thought it was one of those things that they like set up so many enigmas that they were never going to land that plane. And yeah. I'm sorry, what, what series? Severance. Oh, so I've heard it's very good. I think. 
It's unsettling, but it's amazing. It's not Science fiction. Mm -hmm. Servant. Yeah. That, that is one of the few shows that you think it's like, oh, this is like, what? Like, I, the right is crazy. Like, mm -hmm. so, so, so uncomfortable. Oh, uh, Borderland. Yeah. Uh, that's a Finnish, Finnish cop show. Okay. Oh, I like shrinking. I love shrinking. Shrinking. Like shrinking. Oh. Yep. Okay, so I'm sorry for coming on here because we're, 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 we're illustrating one of our theories, which is that when science fiction people get together, they talk about science fiction books, they talk about movies and TV. That's something it's my fault. It was, it was the question post. Yeah. True, true, yeah. We did yeah. not ask what we I did finish that this last season of Stranger Things, which I love. Oh, um, the, the second, I, I thought the third season, was just a repeat of the second, so I was like kind of starting to sign off a little, but then season four was completely new and fresh, and it it brought in like so you have the two big things in Stranger Things, the um the powers of eleven and the, the upside down, and season four tied it all together in a super satisfying way, and and I loved it, I absolutely loved it. I, was, I, was I, I never got past the first half of the first series, and mm -hmm. it's because they. I think it was not because of anything that happened in the first series, although it was really slow and they did go to the upside down twice when they didn't need to. And, <laughs> but um, the, the things they kept comparing it to Spielberg, to the 70 Spielberg productions. I thought, if this were Spielberg doing this story, he would do it in 100 minutes and it would be over. Yeah. He wouldn't take 12 hours <laughs> to tell this story. He would have done it in 100, under 120 minutes, and it would have been great. So, but it was kids on BMX bikes in the suburbs at night. So. Yeah, yeah, same, 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 same. Yeah. 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 Anyone watch yeah. Lockwood and Co? Uh, Lockwood and Co? Mm -hmm. I, I, I just watched it for the love of it. So, mm -hmm. Lockwood and Co. Family Gates Fun Books. What are you reading, Debbie? Oh, um, you know, I'm actually reading Fall of Hyperion, because uh, I had never read Hyperion and Fall of Hyperion, uh, and it was interesting to revisit the pen. But I really loved Hyperion, and I'm about halfway through Fall of, and I'm kind of stalling out now. Uh, I also just did a reread of As By Its Possession, which was really interesting mm. to revisit. Mm. And I just read Money Glory and Monkey Fun. Which you guys said. Yeah, and that. Um, I'm about to read Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow for our book one. <laughs> Wait, I'm, I'm reading Peter Beagle's latest short story collection. Oh. Which is called We Don't Talk About My Brother. Is it good? Yeah. Well, it's Peter Beagle. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, it's magical from beginning to end. So, um, yeah. How about you? Uh, Gentleman's Guide to Vice and Virtue. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. It's a queer historical uh, entitled Young Man on a Tour with his best friend he's in love with. And it's all about him learning how privileged he is. And I, so that I kind of am appreciating that character. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we got a question online. Oh. Um, they said, What advice would you give to someone who inspires to become an author? Wow. Um, right. Yeah. That's, yeah. Because a lot of people want to be an author and they never write anything. Yeah. And, they want to use and you need to, you need to write hundreds of thousands of words before you will write anything that people want to read. So be prepared to devote a lot of time to it. And the other thing is make sure you know why you're writing. As we have said, if you want to write to earn money, there are other, other easier ways to earn money. And marry someone who disagrees. <laughs> yeah, I always give the advice of to finish a novel, to have that experience and learn from it, and um, and go forward. Because so many people start, but it's much rarer to finish. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You must write. You must finish with your, what you write, and you must submit what you finish. So, yeah. And read a lot. And read, read, yeah, widely. read everything. If you're not reading widely, then. It's, it's you don't want to read. Often. Yeah, you don't want to read a fantasy novel by somebody who only reads fantasy novels, 
or who has never read a fantasy novel. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 And I've met those people. Uh-huh. I have a friend who wanted to write a vampire novel and she kept asking me questions. She called me up and say, so what are the rules on vampires drinking blood? And and I would say, well, maybe you should go read a few vampire novels. You know, uh-huh. let me give you a couple. She's like, no, because I want to write something totally different. I uh-huh. want totally different vampires, so I don't want to read any of those. Uh-huh. You can learn that if you want to do something. <laughs> 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 So you was just talking about that in another panel. And really? For, that, for this, that uh, like um, a lot of times, like literary writers will decide they want to write drama fiction, and they won't read anything in that, like the vampire, the next big vampire novel. They won't read anything, and they'll write this. They're like, this is so unique, and they don't understand it. Everything they've written is cliche. Right. And they haven't written anything new because they've never read in the genre. So. Um, all right, well, I'm seeing that the term across the hall has ended, and I feel like that means ours should end, too. Thank you so much. Thanks for hanging in there. See you next year. Yeah. And I think you